section thirty four of curiosities of literature volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org curiosities of literature volume three by isaac disraeli prediction part two in moral predictions on individuals many have discovered the future character the revolutionary character of cardinal de retz even in his youth was detected by the sagacity of mazarin he then wrote the history of the conspiracy of fiesco with such vehement admiration of his hero that the italian politician after its perusal predicted that the young author would be one of the most turbulent spirits of the age the father of marshal Beron, even amid the glory of his son discovered the cloud which invisible to others was to obscure it the father indeed well knew the fiery passions of his son Beron said the domestic seer i advise thee when peace takes place to go and plant cabbages in thy garden otherwise i warn thee thou wilt lose thy head on the scaffold lorenzo de medici had studied the temper of his son piero for guicciardini informs us that he had often complained to his most intimate friends that he foresaw the imprudence and arrogance of his son would occasion the ruin of his family there is a remarkable prediction of james i of the evils likely to ensue from laud's violence in a conversation given by hackett which the king held with archbishop williams when the king was hard pressed to promote laud he gave his reasons why he intended to keep laud back from all place of rule and authority because i find he hath a restless spirit and cannot see when matters are well but loves to toss and change and to bring things to a pitch of reformation floating in his own brain which endangers the steadfastness of that which is in a good pass i speak not at random he hath made himself known to me to be such an one james then gives the circumstances to which he alludes and at length when still pursued by the archbishop then the organ of buckingham as usual this king's good nature too easily yielded he did not however without closing with this prediction then take him to you but on my soul you will repent it the future character of cromwell was apparent to two of our great politicians this coarse unpromising man said lord falkland pointing to cromwell will be the first person in the kingdom if the nation comes to blows and archbishop williams told charles i confidentially there was that in cromwell which foreboded something dangerous and wished his majesty would either win him over to him or get him taken off the marquis of wellesley's incomparable character of bonaparte predicted his fall when highest in his glory that great statesman then poured forth the sublime language of philosophical prophecy his eagerness of power is so inordinate his jealousy of independence so fierce his keenness of appetite so feverish in all that touches his ambition even in the most trifling things that he must plunge into dreadful difficulties he is one of an order of minds that by nature make for themselves great reverses lord mansfield was once asked after the commencement of the french revolution when it would end his lordship replied it is an event without precedent and therefore without prognostic the truth however is that it had both our own history had furnished a precedent in the times of charles i and the prognostics were so redundant that a volume might be collected of passages from various writers who had predicted it however ingenious might be a history of the reformation before it occurred the evidence could not be more authentic and positive than that of the great moral and political revolution which we have witnessed in our own days a prediction which bishop butler threw out in a sermon before the house of lords in seventeen forty one does honour to his political sagacity as well as to his knowledge of human nature 
He calculated that the irreligious spirit would produce, some time or other, political disorders similar to those which, in the seventeenth century, had arisen from religious fanaticism. Is there no danger, he observed, that all this may raise somewhat like that levelling spirit upon atheistical principles which in the last age prevailed upon enthusiastic ones? not to speak of the possibility that different sorts of people may unite in it upon these contrary principles all this literally has been accomplished leibnitz indeed foresaw the results of those selfish and at length demoralizing opinions which began to prevail through europe in his day these disorganizing principles conducted by a political sect who tried to be worse than they could be as old montaigne expresses it a sort of men who have been audaciously congratulated as having a taste for evil exhibited to the astonished world the dismal catastrophe the philosopher predicted i shall give this remarkable passage i find that certain opinions approaching those of epicurus and spinoza are little by little insinuating themselves into the minds of the great rulers of public affairs who serve as the guides of others and on whom all matters depend besides these opinions are also sliding into fashionable books and thus they are preparing all things to that general revolution which menaces europe destroying those generous sentiments of the ancients greek and roman which preferred the love of country and public good and the cares of posterity to fortune and even to life our public spirits footnote public spirit and public spirits were about the year seventeen hundred household words with us leibnitz was struck by their significance but it might now puzzle us to find synonyms or even to explain the very terms themselves End of footnote. as the english call them excessively diminish and are no more in fashion and will be still less while the least vicious of these men preserve only one principle which they call honour a principle which only keeps them from not doing what they deem a low action while they openly laugh at the love of country ridicule those who are zealous for public ends and when a well-intentioned man asks what will become of their posterity they reply then as now but it may happen to these persons themselves to have to endure those evils which they believed are reserved for others if this epidemical and intellectual disorder could be corrected whose bad effects are already visible those evils might still be prevented but if it proceeds in its growth providence will correct man by the very revolution which must spring from it whatever may happen indeed all must turn out as usual for the best in general at the end of the account although this cannot happen without the punishment of those who contribute even to general good by their evil actions the most superficial reader will hardly require a commentary on this very remarkable passage he must instantly perceive how leibnitz in the seventeenth century foresaw what has occurred in the eighteenth and the prediction has been verified in the history of the actors in the late revolution while the result which we have not perhaps yet had according to leibnitz's own exhilarating system of optimism is an eduction of good from evil a great genius who was oppressed by malignant rivals in his own times has been noticed by madame de stal as having left behind him an actual prophecy of the french revolution this was gibert who in his commentary on folard's polybius published in seventeen twenty seven declared that a conspiracy is actually forming in europe by means at once so subtle and efficacious that i am sorry not to have come into the world thirty years later to witness its result 
it must be confessed that the sovereigns of europe wear very bad spectacles the proofs of it are mathematical if such proofs ever were of a conspiracy gibert unquestionably foresaw the anti-monarchical spirit gathering up its mighty wings and rising over the universe but could not judge of the nature of the impulse which he predicted prophesying from the ideas in his luminous intellect he seems to have been far more curious about than certain of of the consequences rousseau even circumstantially predicted the convulsions of modern europe he stood on the crisis of the french revolution which he vividly foresaw for he seriously advised the higher classes of society to have their children taught some useful trade a notion highly ridiculed on the first appearance of the emile but at its hour the awful truth struck he too foresaw the horrors of that revolution for he announced that emile designed to emigrate because from the moral state of the people a virtuous revolution had become impossible Footnote this extraordinary passage is at the close of the third book of emile to which i must refer the reader it is curious however to observe that in seventeen sixty rousseau poured forth the following awful predictions which were considered quite absurd vous vous fiez à l'ordre actuel de la société sans songer que ces ordres est sujet à des révolutions inévitables le grand divion petit le riche devient pauvre le monarque devient sujet nous approchons l'état de crise et du siècle des révolutions que faire donc dans la bassesse sa trappe que vous n'aurez élevé que pour la grandeur que fera donc la pauvreté ce publicain qui ne sait vivre que d'or que fera de pour vous de tout ce fastueux imbécile qui ne sait point où c'est de lui même etc etc End of footnote afterwards the eloquence of burke was often oracular and a speech of pitt in eighteen hundred painted the state of europe as it was only realized fifteen years afterwards but many remarkable predictions have turned out to be false whenever the facts on which the prediction is raised are altered in their situation what was relatively true ceases to operate as a general principle for instance to that striking anticipation which rousseau formed of the french revolution he added by way of note as remarkable a prediction on monarchy je tiens pour impossible que les grandes monarchies de l'europe aient encore longtemps à durer tout en bouillet et tout état qui bouille et sur son déclin the predominant anti-monarchical spirit among our rising generation seems to hasten on the accomplishment of the prophecy but if an important alteration has occurred in the nature of things we may question the result if by looking into the past rousseau found facts which sufficiently proved that nations in the height of their splendor and corruption had closed their career by falling an easy conquest to barbarous invaders who annihilated the most polished people at a single blow we now find that no such power any longer exists in the great family of europe the state of the question is therefore changed it is now how corrupt nations will act against corrupt nations equally enlightened but if the citizen of geneva drew his prediction of the extinction of monarchy in europe from that predilection for democracy which assumes that a republic must necessarily produce more happiness to the people than a monarchy then we say that the fatal experiment was again repeated since the prediction and the fact proved not true the excess of democracy inevitably terminates in a monarchical state and were all the monarchies in europe at present republics a philosopher might safely predict the restoration of monarchy if a prediction be raised on facts which our own prejudices induce us to infer will exist it must be chimerical we have an universal chronicle of the monk carrion printed in fifteen thirty two in which he announces that the world was about ending Footnote this prediction of the end of the world is one of the most popular hallucinations warmly received by many whenever it is promulgated 
it had the most marked effect when the cycle of a thousand years after the birth of christ was approaching completion and the world was assured that was the limit of its present state numerous acts of piety were performed churches were built religious houses founded and asceticism became the order of the day until the dreaded year was completed without the accompaniment of the supernatural horrors so generally feared the world soon relapsed into forgetfulness and went on as before very many prophecies have since been promulgated and in defiance of such repeated failures are still occasionally indulged in by persons from whom better things might be expected richard brothers in the last century and more than one reverend gentleman in the present one have been bold enough to fix an exact time for the event but it has passed as quietly as the thousandth anniversary noted above End of footnote as well as his chronicle of it that the turkish empire would not last many years that after the death of charles v the empire of germany would be torn to pieces by the germans themselves this monk will no longer pass for a prophet he belongs to that class of historians who write to humour their own prejudices like a certain lady prophetess who in eighteen eleven predicted that grass was to grow in cheapside about this time footnote one of the most effective prophecies against london and which frightened for the time a very large number of its inhabitants was that given out in the spring of seventeen fifty after a slight shock of an earthquake was felt in london and it was prophesied that another should occur which would destroy the town and all its inhabitants all the roads were thronged with persons flying to the country a day or two before the threatened event and they were all unmercifully ridiculed when the day passed over quietly walpole in one of his amusing letters speaks of a party who went to an inn ten miles out of town where they are to play at brag till five in the morning and then come back i suppose to look for the bones of their husbands and families under the rubbish jokers who were out late amused themselves by bawling in the watchman's voice past four o'clock and a dreadful earthquake a pamphlet purporting to be a full and true account of this earthquake which never happened was printed for tim tremor in fleet street seventeen fifty and made the vehicle for much personal satire thus it is stated that the commissioners of westminster bridge have ordered this calamity to be entered in their books as a glorious excuse for the next sinking pier and that the town received some comfort upon hearing that the inns of court were all sunk and several orders were given that no one should assist in bringing any one lawyer above ground End of footnote. the monk carrion like others of greater name had miscalculated the weeks of daniel and wished more ill to the mahometans than suit the christian cabinets of europe to inflict on them and lastly the monastic historian had no notion that it would please providence to prosper the heresy of luther sir james mackintosh once observed i am sensible that in the field of political prediction veteran sagacity has often been deceived sir james alluded to the memorable example of harrington who published a demonstration of the impossibility of re-establishing monarchy in england six months before the restoration of charles the second but the author of the oceana was a political fanatic who ventured to predict an event not by other similar events but by a theoretical principle which he had formed that the balance of power depends on that of property harrington in his contracted view of human nature had dropped out of his calculation all the stirring passions of ambition and party and the vacillations of the multitude a similar error of a great genius occurs in defoe child says mr george chalmers foreseeing from experience that men's conduct must finally be decided by their principles foretold the colonial revolt defoe allowing his prejudices to obscure his sagacity reprobated that suggestion because he deemed interest a more strenuous prompter than enthusiasm 
the predictions of harrington and defoe are precisely such as we might expect from a petty calculator a political economist who can see nothing farther than immediate results but the true philosophical predictor was child who had read the past it is probable that the american emancipation from the mother country of england was foreseen twenty or thirty years before it occurred though not perhaps by the administration lord orford writing in seventeen fifty four under the ministry of the duke of newcastle blames the instructions to the governor of new york which seemed better calculated for the latitude of mexico and for a spanish tribunal than for a free british settlement and in such opulence and such haughtiness that suspicions had long been conceived of their meditating to throw off the dependence on their mother country if this was written at the time as the author asserts it is a very remarkable passage observes the noble editor of his memoirs the prognostics or presages of this revolution it may now be difficult to recover but it is evident that child before the time when lord orford wrote this passage predicted the separation on true and philosophical principles even when the event does not always justify the prediction the predictor may not have been the less correct in his principles of divination the catastrophe of human life and the turn of great events often prove accidental marshal biron whom we have noticed might have ascended the throne instead of the scaffold cromwell and de retz might have become only the favourite general or the minister of their sovereigns fortuitous events are not comprehended in the reach of human prescience such must be consigned to those vulgar superstitions which presume to discover the issue of human events without pretending to any human knowledge there is nothing supernatural in the prescience of the philosopher sometimes predictions have been condemned as false ones which when scrutinized we can scarcely deem to have failed they may have been accomplished and they may again revolve on us in seventeen forty nine dr hartley published his observations on man and predicted the fall of the existing governments and hierarchies in two simple propositions among others proposition eighty one it is probable that all the civil governments will be overturned proposition eighty two it is probable that the present forms of church government will be dissolved many were alarmed at these predicted falls of church and state lady charlotte wentworth asked hartley when these terrible things would happen the answer of the predictor was not less awful i am an old man and shall not live to see them but you are a young woman and probably will see them in the subsequent revolutions of america and of france and perhaps now of spain we can hardly deny that these predictions had failed a fortuitous event has once more thrown back europe into its old corners but we still revolve in a circle and what is now dark and remote may again come round when time has performed its great cycle there was a prophetical passage in hooker's ecclesiastical polity regarding the church which long occupied the speculations of its expounders hooker indeed seemed to have done what no predictor of events should do he fixed on the period of its accomplishment in fifteen ninety seven he declared that it would peradventure fall out to be threescore and ten years or if strength do awe into fourscore those who had outlived the revolution in sixteen forty one when the long parliament pulled down the ecclesiastical establishment and sold the church lands a circumstance which hooker had contemplated and were afterwards returned to their places on the restoration imagined that the prediction had not yet been completed and were looking with great anxiety towards the year sixteen seventy seven for the close of this extraordinary prediction when bishop barlow in sixteen seventy five was consulted on it he endeavoured to dissipate the panic by referring to an old historian who had reproached our nation for their proneness to prophecies Footnote. an eye-witness of the great fire of london has noted the difficulty of obtaining effective assistance in endeavouring to stay its progress owing to the superstition which sees many persons because a prophecy of mother shipton's was quoted to show that london was doomed to hopeless and entire destruction End of footnote 
the prediction of the venerable hooker in truth had been fully accomplished and the event had occurred without bishop barlow having recurred to it so easy it seems to forget what we dislike to remember the period of time was too literally taken and seems to have been only the figurative expression of man's age in scriptural language which hooker had employed but no one will now deny that this prescient sage had profoundly foreseen the results of that rising party whose designs on church and state were clearly depicted in his own luminous view the philosophical predictor in foretelling a crisis from the appearance of things will not rashly assign the period of time for the crisis which he anticipates is calculated on by that inevitable march of events which generate each other in human affairs but the period is always dubious being either retarded or accelerated by circumstances of a nature incapable of entering into this moral arithmetic it is probable that a revolution similar to that of france would have occurred in this country had it not been counteracted by the genius of pitt in sixteen eighteen it was easy to foretell by the political prognostic that a mighty war throughout europe must necessarily occur at that moment observes bayle the house of austria aimed at a universal monarchy the consequent domineering spirit of the ministers of the emperor and the king of spain combined with their determination to exterminate the new religion excited a reaction to this imperial despotism public opinion had been suppressed till every people grew impatient while their sovereigns influenced by national feeling were combining against austria but austria was a vast military power and her generals were the first of their class the efforts of europe would then be often repulsed this state of affairs prognosticated a long war and when at length it broke out it lasted thirty years the approach and the duration of the war might have been predicted but the period of its termination could not have been foreseen there is however a spirit of political vaticination which presumes to pass beyond the boundaries of human prescience it has been often ascribed to the highest source of inspiration by enthusiasts but since the language of prophecy has ceased such pretensions are not less impious than they are unphilosophical knox the reformer possessed an extraordinary portion of this awful prophetic confidence he appears to have predicted several remarkable events and the fates of some persons we are told that condemned to a galley at rochelle he predicted that within two or three years he should preach the gospel at st giles's in edinburgh an improbable event which happened of marion darnley he pronounced that as the king for the queen's pleasure had gone to mass the lord and his justice would make her the instrument of his overthrow other striking predictions of the deaths of thomas maitland and of kirkcaldy of grange and the warning he solemnly gave to the regent murray not to go to linlithgow where he was assassinated occasioned a barbarous people to imagine that the prophet knox had received an immediate communication from heaven a spanish friar and almanac maker predicted in clear and precise words the death of henry the fourth of france and pieres though he had no faith in the vain science of astrology yet alarmed at whatever menaced the life of a beloved monarch consulted with some of the king's friends and had the spanish almanac laid before his majesty that high-spirited monarch thanked them for their solicitude but utterly slighted the prediction the event occurred and in the following year the spanish friar spread his own fame in a new almanac i have been occasionally struck at the jeremiads of honest george withers the vaticinating poet of our civil wars some of his works afford many solemn predictions we may account for many predictions of this class without the intervention of any supernatural agency among the busy spirits of a revolutionary age the heads of a party such as knox have frequently secret communications with spies or with friends in a constant source of concealed information a shrewd confident and enthusiastic temper will find ample matter for mysterious prescience knox exercised that deep sagacity which took in the most enlarged views of the future as appears by his machiavellian foresight on the barbarous destruction of the monasteries and the cathedrals the best way to keep the rooks from returning is to pull down their nests 
in the case of the prediction of the death of henry the fourth by the spanish friar it, it resulted either from his being acquainted with the plot or from his being made an instrument for their purpose by those who were it appears that rumours of henry's assassination were rife in spain and italy before the event occurred such vaticinators as george withers will always rise in those disturbed times which his own prosaic metre has forcibly depicted it may be on that darkness which they find within their hearts a sudden light hath shined making reflections of some things to come which leave within them musings troublesome to their weak spirits or to intricate for them to put in order and relate they act as men in ecstasies have done striving their cloudy visions to declare and i perhaps among these may be one that was let loose for service to be done i blunder out what worldly prudent men count madness page seven separating human prediction from inspired prophecy we only ascribe to the faculties of man that acquired prescience which we have demonstrated that some great minds have unquestionably exercised we have discovered its principles in the necessary dependence of effects on general causes and we have shown that impelled by the same motives and circumscribed by the same passions all human affairs revolve in a circle and we have opened the true source of this yet imperfect science of moral and political prediction in an intimate but a discriminative knowledge of the past authority is sacred when experience affords parallels and analogies if much which may overwhelm when it shall happen can be foreseen the prescient statesman and moralist may provide defensive measures to break the waters whose streams they cannot always direct and the venerable hooker has profoundly observed that the best things have been overthrown not so much by puissance and might of adversaries as through defective counsel in those that should have upheld and defended the same footnote hooker wrote this about fifteen sixty and he wrote before the siecle des revolutions had begun even among ourselves he penetrated into this important principle merely by the force of his own meditation at this moment after more practical experience in political revolutions a very intelligent french writer in a pamphlet entitled monsieur de Villiers, says experience proclaims a great truth namely that revolutions themselves cannot succeed except when they are favoured by a portion of the government he illustrates the axiom by the different revolutions which have occurred in his nation within these thirty years it is the same truth traced to its source by another road End of footnote the philosophy of history blends the past with the present and combines the present with the future each is but a portion of the other the actual state of a thing is necessarily determined by its antecedent and thus progressively through the chain of human existence while the present is always full of the future as leibniz has happily expressed the idea a new and beautiful light is thus thrown over the annals of mankind by the analogies and the parallels of different ages in succession how the seventeenth century has influenced the eighteenth and the results of the nineteenth as they shall appear in the twentieth might open a source of predictions to which however difficult it might be to affix their dates there would be none in exploring into causes and tracing their inevitable effects the multitude live only among the shadows of things in the appearances of the present the learned busied with the past can only trace whence and how all comes but he who is one of the people and one of the learned the true philosopher views the natural tendency and terminations which are preparing for the future End of section thirty four Section 35 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Annie Hill. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 3, by Isaac Disraeli. Dreams at the Dawn of Philosophy. Modern philosophy, theoretical or experimental, only amuses while the action of discovery is suspended or advances the interest ceases 
with the inquirer when the catastrophe is ascertained as in the romance whose denouement turns on a mysterious incident which once unfolded all future agitation ceases but in the true infancy of science philosophers were as imaginative a race as poets marvels and portents undemonstrable and undefinable with occult fancies perpetually beginning and never ending were delightful as the shifting cantos of ariosto then science entranced the eye by its thaumaturgy when they looked through an optic tube they believed they were looking into futurity or starting at some shadow darkening the glassy globe beheld the absent person while the mechanical inventions of art were toys and tricks with sometimes an automaton which frightened them with life the earlier votaries of modern philosophy only witnessed as garofel calls his collection unheard of curiosities this state of the marvellous of which we are now for ever deprived prevailed among the philosophers and the virtuosi in europe and with ourselves long after the establishment of the royal society philosophy then depended mainly on authority a single one however was sufficient so that when this had been repeated by fifty others they had the authority of fifty honest men whoever the first man might have been they were then a blissful race of children rambling here and there in a golden age of innocence and ignorance where at every step each gifted discoverer whispered to the few some half-concealed secret of nature or played with some toy of art some invention with great difficulty performed what without it might have been done with great ease the cabinets of the lovers of mechanical arts formed enchanted apartments where the admirers feared to stir or look about them while the philosophers themselves half imagined they were the very thaumaturgy for which the world gave them too much credit at least for their quiet would we run after the shadows in this gleaming land of moonshine or sport with these children in the fresh morning of science ere aurora had scarcely peeped on the hills we must enter into their feelings view with their eyes and believe all they confide to us and out of these bundles of dreams sometimes pick out one or two for our own dreaming they are the fairy tales and the arabian nights entertainments of science but if the reader is stubbornly mathematical and logical he will only be holding up a great torch against the muslin curtain upon which the fantastic shadows playing upon it must vanish at the instant it is an amusement which can only take place by carefully keeping himself in the dark footnote one nine seven goodwin's amusing lives of the necromancers abound in marvellous stories of the supernatural feats of these old students End of footnote. what a subject were i to enter on it would be the narratives of magical writers these precious volumes have been so constantly wasted by the profane that now a book of real magic requires some to find it as well as a great magician to use it albertus magnus or albert the great as he is erroneously styled for this sage only derived this enviable epitaph from his surname de groot as did hugo grotius this sage in his admirable secrets delivers his opinion that these books of magic should be most preciously preserved for he prophetically added the time is arriving when they would be understood it seems that they were not intelligible in the thirteenth century but if albertus had not miscalculated in the present day they may be magical terms with talismanic figures may yet conceal many a secret gunpowder came down to us in a sort of anagram and the kaleidoscope with all its interminable multiplications of forms lay at hand for two centuries in baptista porta's natural magic the abbot trithemius in a confidential letter happened to call himself a magician perhaps at the moment he thought himself one and sent three or four leaves stuffed with the names of devils and with their evocations 
at the death of his friend these leaves fell into the unworthy hands of the prior who was so frightened on the first glance at the diabolical nomenclature that he raised the country against the abbot and trithemius was nearly a lost man yet after all this evocation of devils has reached us in his steganographia and proves to be only one of this ingenious abbot's polygraphic attempts at secret writing for he had flattered himself that he had invented a mode of concealing his thoughts from all the world while he communicated them to a friend roger bacon promised to raise thunder and lightning and disperse clouds by dissolving them into rain the first magical process has been obtained by franklin and the other of far more use to our agriculturists may perchance be found lurking in some corner which has been overlooked in the opus magis of our dr mirabilis do we laugh at their magical works of art are we ourselves such indifferent artists cornelius agrippa before he wrote his vanity of the arts and sciences intended to reduce into a system and method the secret of communicating with spirits and demons footnote one nine eight agrippa was the most fortunate and honoured of occult philosophers he was lodged at courts and favoured by all his contemporaries scholars like erasmus spoke of him with admiration and royalty constantly sought his powers of divination but in advanced life he was accused of sorcery and died poor in fifteen thirty four end of footnote on good authority that of porphyrius silas plotinus jamblicus and on better were it necessary to allege it he was well assured that the upper regions of the air swarmed with what the greeks called demons just as our lower atmosphere is full of birds our waters of fish and our earth of insects yet this occult philosopher who knew perfectly eight languages and married two wives with whom he had never exchanged a harsh word in any of them was everywhere avoided as having by his side for his companion a personage no less than a demon this was a great black dog whom he suffered to stretch himself out among his magical manuscripts or lie on his bed often kissing and patting him and feeding him on choice morsels yet for this would paulus jovius and all the world have had him put into the ordeal of fire and faggot the truth was afterwards boldly asserted by wierus his learned domestic who believed that his master's dog was really nothing more than what he appeared i believe says he that he was a real natural dog he was indeed black but of a moderate size and i have often led him by a string and called him by the french name agrippa had given him monsieur and he had a female who was called mademoiselle i wonder how authors of such great characters should write so absurdly on his vanishing at his death nobody knows how but as it was probable that monsieur and mademoiselle must have generated some puppy demons wierus ought to have been more circumstantial albertus magnus for thirty years had never ceased working at a man of brass and had cast together the qualities of his materials under certain constellations which threw such a spirit into his man of brass that it was reported his growth was visible his feet legs thighs shoulder neck and head expanded and made the city of cologne uneasy at possessing one citizen too mighty for them all this man of brass when he reached his maturity was so loquacious that albert's master the great scholastic thomas aquinas one day tired of his babble and declaring it was a devil or devilish with his staff knocked the head off and what was extraordinary this brazen man like any human being thus effectually silenced word never spake more this incident is equally historical and authentic though whether heads of brass can speak and even prophesy was indeed a subject of profound inquiry even at a latter period footnote one nine nine one of the most popular of our old english prose romances the history of friar bacon narrates how he had intended to wall england about with brass by means of such a brazen head 
had not the stupidity of a servant prevented him the tale may be read in thomas's collection of early english prose romances End of footnote. nod who never questioned their vocal powers but was puzzled concerning the nature of this new species of animal has no doubt most judiciously stated the question whether these speaking brazen heads had a sensitive and reasoning nature or whether demons spoke in them but brass has not the faculty of providing its own nourishment as we see in plants and therefore they were not sensitive and as for the act of reasoning these brazen heads presume to know nothing but the future with the past and present they seem totally unacquainted so that their memory and their observation were very limited and as for the future that is always doubtful and obscure even to heads of brass this learned man then infers that these brazen heads could have no reasoning faculties for nothing altered their nature they said what they had to say which no one could contradict and having said their say you might have broken the head for anything more that you could have got out of it had they had any life in them would they not have moved as well as spoken life itself is but motion and they had no lungs no spleen and in fact though they spoke they had no tongue was a devil in them i think not yet why should men have taken all this trouble to make not a man but a trumpet our profound philosopher was right not to agitate the question whether these brazen heads had ever spoken why should not a man of brass speak since a doll can whisper a statue play chess footnote two hundred the allusion here is to the automaton chess player first exhibited by kempelen its adventure in england about seventeen eighty five the figure was habited as a turk and placed behind a chest this was opened by the exhibitor to display the machinery which seemed to give the figure motion while playing intricate games of chess with any of the spectators but it has been fully demonstrated that this chest could conceal a full-grown man who could place his arm down that of the figure and direct its movements in the game the machinery being really constructed to hide him and disarm suspicion as the whole trick has been demonstrated by diagrams the marvellous nature of the machinery is exploded End of footnote. and brass ducks have performed the whole process of digestion footnote 201. this brass duck was the work of a very ingenious mechanist m balkinson it's reported to have uttered its natural voice moved its wings drank water and ate corn in seventeen thirty eight he delighted the parisians by a figure of a shepherd which played on a pipe and beat a tabor and a flute player who performed twelve tunes End of footnote. and another magical invention has been ridiculed with equal reason a magician was annoyed as philosophers still are by passengers in the street and he particularly so by having horses led to drink under his window he made a magical horse of wood according to one of the books of hermes which perfectly answered its purpose by frightening away the horses or rather the grooms the wooden horse no doubt gave some palpable kick the same magical story might have been told of dr franklin who finding that under his window the passengers had discovered a spot which they made too convenient for themselves he charged it with his newly discovered electrical fire after a few remarkable incidents had occurred which at a former period would have lodged the great discoverer of electricity in the inquisition the modern magician succeeded just as well as the ancient who had the advantage of coning over the books of hermes instead of ridiculing these works of magic let us rather become magicians ourselves the works of the ancient alchemists have afforded numberless discoveries to modern chemists nor is even their grand operation despaired of if they have of late not been so renowned this has arisen from a want of what ashmole calls a pertness 
a qualification early inculcated among these illuminated sages we find authentic accounts of people who have lived three centuries with tolerable complexions possessed of nothing but a crucible and a bellows but they were so unnecessarily mysterious that whenever such a person was discovered he was sure in an instant to disappear and was never afterwards heard of in the liber patris sapiente this selfish consciousness is all along impressed on the student for the accomplishment of the great mystery in the commentary on this precious work of the alchemist norton who counsels be thou in a place secret by thyself alone that no man see or hear what thou shalt say or done trust not thy friend too much wheresoe'er thou go for he thou trustest best some time may be thy foe ashmole observes that norton gives exceeding good advice to the student in this science where he bids him be secret in the carrying on of his studies and operations and not to let any one know of his undertakings but his good angel and himself and such a close and retired breast had norton's master who when men disputed of colours of the rose he would not speak but kept himself full close we regret that by each leaving all his knowledge to his good angel and himself it has happened that the good angels have kept it all to themselves it cannot however be denied that if they could not always extract gold out of lead they sometimes succeeded in washing away the pimples on ladies faces notwithstanding that sir kenelm digby poisoned his most beautiful lady because as sancho would have said he was one of those who would have his bread whiter than the finest wheaten van helmont who could not succeed in discovering the true elixir of life however hit on the spirit of hartshorn which for a good while he considered was the wonderful elixir itself restoring to life persons who seemed to have lost it and though this delightful enthusiast could not raise a ghost yet he thought he had for he raised something aerial from spa water which mistaking it for a ghost he gave it that very name a name which we still retain in gas from the german geist or ghost paraclesiast carried the tiny spirits about him in the hilt of his great sword having first discovered the qualities of laudanum this illustrious quack made use of it as a universal remedy and distributed it in the form of pills which he carried in the basket hilt of his sword the operations he performed were as rapid as they seemed magical doubtless we have lost some inconceivable secrets by some unexpected occurrences which the secret itself would seem ought to have prevented taking place when a philosopher had discovered the art of prolonging life to an indefinite period it is most provoking to find that he should have allowed himself to die at an early age we have a very authentic history from sir kenelm digby himself that when he went in disguise to visit descartes at his retirement at egmond lamenting the brevity of life which hindered philosophers getting on in their studies the french philosopher assured him that he had considered that matter to render a man immortal was what he could not promise but that he was very sure it was possible to lengthen out his life to the period of the patriarchs and when his death was announced to the world the abbe picot an ardent disciple for a long time would not believe it possible and at length insisted that if it had occurred it must have been owing to some mistake of the philosophers the late holcroft lutherburg and costway imagined that they should escape the vulgar era of scriptural life by reorganizing their old bones and moistening their dry marrow their new principles of vitality were supposed by them to be found in the powers of the mind this seemed more reasonable but proved to be as little efficacious as those other philosophies who imagine they have detected the hidden principle of life in the eels frisking in vinegar and allude to the bookbinder who creates the bookworm paraclesis has revealed to us one of the grandest secrets of nature 
when the world began to dispute on the very existence of the elementary folk it was then that he boldly offered to give birth to a fairy and has sent down to posterity the recipe he describes the impurity which is to be transmuted into such purity the gross elements of a delicate fairy which fixed in a vial placed in a fuming dung will in due time settle into a full-grown fairy bursting through its vitreous prison on the vivifying principle by which the ancient egyptians hatch their eggs in ovens i recollect that dr farmer's sale the leaf which preserved this recipe for making a fairy forcibly folded down by the learned commentator from which we must infer the credit he gave to the experiment there was a greatness of mind in Periclesis, who having furnished a recipe to make a fairy had the delicacy to refrain from its formation even baptista porta one of the most enlightened philosophers does not deny the possibility of engendering creatures which at their full growth shall not exceed the size of a mouse but he adds they are only pretty little dogs to play with were these akin to the fairies of periclesis footnote two o two this great charlatan after many successful impositions ended his life in poverty in the hospital of salzburg in fifteen forty one end of footnote they were well convinced of the existence of such elemental beings frequent accidents in mines showed the potency of the metallic spirits which so tormented the workmen in some of the german mines by blindness giddiness and sudden sickness that they have been obliged to abandon mines well known to be rich in silver a metallic spirit at one sweep annihilated twelve miners who were all found dead together the fact was unquestionable and the safety lamp was undiscovered never was a philosophical imagination more beautiful than that exquisite palingenesis as it had been termed from the greek or a regeneration or rather the apparitions of animals and plants schott kircher gaffarel borelli digby and the whole of that admirable school discovered in the ashes of plants their primitive forms which were again raised up by the force of heat nothing they say perishes in nature all is but a continuation or a revival the semina of resurrection are concealed in extinct bodies as in the blood of man the ashes of roses will again revive into roses though smaller and paler than if they had been planted unsubstantial and unodiferous they are not roses which grow on rose trees but their delicate apparitions and like apparitions they are seen but for a moment the process of the palingenesis this picture of immortality is described these philosophers having burnt a flower by calcination disengaged the salts from its ashes and deposited them in a glass vial a chemical mixture acted on it till in the fermentation they assumed a bluish and a spectral hue this dust thus excited by heat shoots upward into its primitive forms by sympathy the parts unite and while each is returning to its destined place we see distinctly the stalk the leaves and the flowers arise it is the pale spectre of a flower coming slowly forth from its ashes the heat passes away the magical scene declines till the whole matter again precipitates itself into the chaos at the bottom this vegetable phoenix lies thus concealed in its cold ashes till the presence of heat produces this resurrection in its absence it returns to its death thus the dead naturally revive and a corpse may give out its shadowy reanimation when not too deeply buried in the earth bodies corrupted in their graves have risen particularly the murdered for murderers are apt to bury their victims in a slight and hasty manner their salts exhaled in vapour by means of their fermentation have arranged themselves on the surface of the earth and formed those phantoms which at night have often terrified the passing spectator as authentic history witnesses they have opened the graves of the phantom and discovered the bleeding corpse beneath hence 
it is astonishing how many ghosts may be seen at night after a recent battle standing over their corpses on the same principle my old philosopher gaffarel conjectures on the reigning of frogs but these frogs we must conceive can only be the ghosts of frogs and gaffarel himself has modestly opened this fact by a peradventure a more satisfactory origin of ghosts modern philosophy has not afforded and who does not believe in the existence of ghosts for as dr moore forcibly says that there should be so universal a fame and fear of that which never was nor is nor can be ever in the world is to me the greatest miracle of all if there had not been at some time or other true miracles it had not been so easy to impose on the people by false the alchemist would never go about to sophisticate metals to pass them off for true gold and silver unless that such a thing was acknowledged as true gold and silver in the world the pharmacopoeia of those times combined more of morals with medicine than our own they discovered that the agate rendered a man eloquent and even witty a laurel leaf placed on the centre of the skull fortified the memory the brains of fowls and birds of swift wing wonderfully helped the imagination all such specifics have now disappeared and have greatly reduced the chances of an invalid recovering that which perhaps he never possessed lentils and rapeseed were a certain cure for the smallpox and very obviously their grains resembling the spots of this disease they discovered that those who lived on fair plants became fair those on fruitful ones were never barren on the principle that hercules acquired his mighty strength by feeding on the marrow of lions but their talismans provided they were genuine seem to have been wonderfully operative and had we the same confidence and melted down the guineas we give physicians engraving on them talismanic figures i would answer for the good effects of the experiment naudé indeed has utterly ridiculed the occult virtues of talismans in his defence of virgil accused of being a magician the poet it seems cast into a well a talisman of a horse leech graven on a plate of gold to drive away the great number of horse leeches which infested naples naudé positively denies that talismans ever possessed any such occult virtues gaffarel regrets that so judicious a man as naudé should have gone this length giving the lie to so many authentic authors and naudé's paradox is indeed as strange as his denial he suspects the thing is not true because it is so generally told it leads one to suspect says he as animals are said to have been driven away from so many places by these talismans whether they were ever driven from any one place gaffarel suppressing by his good temper his indignant feelings at such reasoning turns the paradox on its maker as if because of the great number of battles that hannibal is reported to have fought with the romans we might not by the same reason doubt whether he fought any one with them the reader must be aware that the strength of the argument lies entirely with the firm believer in talismans gaffarel indeed who passed his days in collecting curiosities in Nuis, is a most authentic historian of unparalleled events even in his own times such as that heavy rain in poitou which showered down petit bestioles little creatures like bishops with their mitres and monks with their capuchins over their heads it is true afterwards they all turned into butterflies the museums the cabinets and the inventions of our early virtuosi were the baby houses of philosophers baptista porta bishop wilkins and ole ashmole were they now living had been enrolled among the quiet members of the society of arts instead of flying in the air collecting a wing of the phoenix as tradition goes or catching the disjointed syllables of an old doting astrologer but these early dilettanti had not derived the same pleasure from the useful inventions of the aforesaid 
society of arts as they received from what cornelius agrippa in a fit of spleen calls things vain and superfluous invented to no other end but for pomp and idle pleasure baptista porta was more skilful in the mysteries of art and nature than any man in his day having found the academy the gaily oziosi he held an inferior association in his own house called the secreti where none was admitted but those elect who had communicated some secret for in the early period of modern art and science the slightest novelty became a secret not to be confided to the uninitiated porta was unquestionably a fine genius as his works still show but it was his misfortune that he attributed his own penetrating sagacity to his skill in the art of divination he considered himself a prognosticator and what was more unfortunate some eminent persons really thought he was predictions and secrets are harmless provided they are not believed but his holiness finding portas were warned him that magical sciences were great hindrances to the study of the bible and paid him the compliment to forbid his prophesying portas genius was now limited to astonish and sometimes to terrify the more ingenious part of i secreti on entering his cabinet some phantom of an attendant was sure to be hovering in the air moving as he who entered moved or he observed in some mirror that his face was twisted on the wrong side of his shoulders and did not quite think that all was right when he clapped his hand on it or passing through a darkened apartment a magical landscape burst on him with human beings in motion the boughs of trees bending and the very clouds passing over the sun or sometimes banquets battles and hunting parties were in the same apartment all these spectacles my friends have witnessed exclaims the self-delighted baptista porta when his friends drank wine out of the same cup which he had used they were mortified with wonder for he drank wine and they only water or on a summer's day when all complained of the sirocco he would freeze his guests with cold air in the room or on a sudden let off a flying dragon to sail along with a cracker in its tail and a cat tied on his back shrill was the sound and awful was the concussion so that it required strong nerves in any age of apparitions and devils to meet this great philosopher when in his best humour albertus magnus entertained the earl of holland as that earl passed through cologne in a severe winter with a warm summer scene luxuriant in fruits and flowers the fact is related by trithemius and this magical scene connected with his vocal head and his books de secretis mulierum and de mirabilibus confirmed the accusations they raised against the great albert for being a magician his apologist theophilus reynaud is driven so hard to defend albertus that he at once asserts the winter change to summer and the speaking head to be two infamous flams he will not believe these authenticated facts although he credits a miracle which proves the sanctity of albertus after three centuries the body of albert the great remained as sweet as ever whether such enchantments as old mandeville cautiously observeth two centuries preceding the days of porta were by craft or by nigromancy i want ne'er but that they were not unknown to chaucer appears in his francoline's tale where minutely describing them he communicates the same pleasure he must himself have received from the ocular illusions of the tregatur or jugalur chaucer ascribed the miracle to a natural magique in which however it was unsettled whether the prince of darkness was a party concerned for i am sicker that there be sciences by which men maketh diverse appearances switch as this subtle tregatures play for oft at fests have i well heard say the tregatures within a hall large have made come in a water and a barge and in the hall grown up and down some hath seemed come a grim leon and sometimes floors spring as in a maid 
sometime a vine and grapes white and red sometime a castle all of lime and stone and when hem liketh voideth it anon thus seemeth it to every man's sight bishop wilkins museum was visited by evelyn who described the sort of curiosities which occupied and amused the children of science here too there was a hollow statue which gave a voice and uttered words by a long concealed pipe that went to its mouth whilst one speaks through it at a good distance a circumstance which perhaps they were not then aware revealed the whole mystery of the ancient oracles which they attributed to demons rather than to tubes pulleys and wheels they learned charles Peyton in his scientific travels records among other valuable productions of art a cherry stone on which were engraven about a dozen and a half portraits even the greatest of human geniuses leonardo da vinci to attract the royal patronage created a lion which ran before the french monarch dropping fleur-de-lis from its shaggy breast and another philosopher who had a spinet which played and stopped at command might have made a revolution in the arts and sciences had the half-stifled child that was concealed in it not been forced unluckily to crawl into daylight and thus it was proved that a philosopher might be an impostor the arts as well as the sciences at the first institution of the royal society were of the most amusing class the famous sir samuel morland had turned his house into an enchanted palace everything was full of devices which showed art and mechanism in perfection his coach carried a travelling kitchen for it had a fireplace and a grate with which he could make soup boil cutlets and roast an egg and he dressed his meat by clockwork another of these virtuosi who is described as a gentleman of superior order and whose house was a knick-knackatory valued himself on his multifarious inventions but most in sowing salads in the morning to be cut for dinner the house of winstanley who afterwards raised the first eddystone lighthouse must have been the wonder of the age if you kicked aside an old slipper purposely lying in your way up started a ghost before you or if you sat down in a certain chair a couple of gigantic arms would immediately clasp you there was an arbour in the garden by the side of a canal you had scarcely seated yourself when you were sent out afloat into the middle of the canal from whence you could not escape till this man of art and science wound you up to the arbour what was passing at the royal society was also occurring at the academie des sciences at paris a great and gouty member of that philosophical body on the departure of a stranger would point to his legs to show the impossibility of conducting him to the door yet the astonished visitor never failed finding the virtuoso waiting for him on the outside to make his final bow while the visitor was going down the stairs this inventive genius was descending with great velocity in a machine from the window so that he proved that if a man of science cannot force nature to walk downstairs he may drive her out at the window if they travelled at home they set off to note down prodigies dr plot in a magnificent project of journeying through england for the advantage of learning and trade and the discovery of antiquities and other curiosities for which he solicited the royal aid which leyland enjoyed among other notable designs discriminates a class thus next i shall inquire of animals and first of strange people strange accidents that attend corporations or families as that the deans of rochester ever since the foundation by turns have died deans and bishops the bird with a white breast that haunts the family of oxenham near exeter just before the death of any of that family the bodies of trees that are seen to swim in a pool near brereton in cheshire a certain warning to the heir of that honourable family to prepare for the next world and such remarkables as number of children such as the lady temple 
who before she died saw seven hundred descended from her footnote two o three similar popular fallacies may be seen carefully noted in r burton's admirable curiosities rarities and wonders in england scotland and ireland sixteen eighty four it is one of those curious volumes of folklore sent out by nat crouch the bookseller under a fictitious name End of footnote. this fellow of the royal society who lived nearly to seventeen hundred was requested to give an edition of pliny we have lost the benefit of a most copious commentary bishop hall went to the spa the wood about that place was haunted not only by freebooters but by wolves and witches although these last are oft-times but one they were called lupus gero and the greeks it seems knew them by the name lycanropos men wolves witches that have put on the shapes of those cruel beasts we saw a boy there whose half-face was devoured by one of them near the village yet so as that the ear was rather cut than bitten off rumour had spread that the boy had had half his face devoured when it was examined it turned out that his ear had only been scratched however there can be no doubt of the existence of witch wolves for hall saw at limburg one of those miscreants executed who confessed on the wheel to have devoured two and forty children in that form they would probably have found it difficult to have summoned the mothers who had lost the children but observe our philosopher's reasoning it would ask a large volume to scan this problem of lycanthropy he had laboriously collected all the evidence and had added his arguments the result offers a curious instance of acute reasoning on a wrong principle footnote two o four hall's postulate is that god's work could not admit of any substantial change which is above the reach of all infernal powers but herein the devil plays the double sophister the sorcerer with sorcerers he both deludes the witch's conceit and the beholder's eyes in a word hall believes in what he cannot understand yet hall will not believe one of the catholic miracles of the virgin of louvain though lipsius had written a book to commemorate the goddess as hall sarcastically calls her hall was told with great indignation in the shop of the bookseller of lipsius that when james i had just looked over this work he flung it down vociferating damnation to him that made it and to him that believes it End of footnote. men of science and art then pass their days in a bustle of the marvellous i will furnish a specimen of philosophical correspondence in a letter to old john albury the writer betrays the versatility of his curiosity by very opposite discoveries my hands are so full of work that i have no time to transcribe for dr henry moore an account of the barn stable apparition lord keeper north would take it kindly from you give a sight of this letter from barn stable to dr witchcott he had lately heard of a scotchman who had been carried by fairies into france but the purpose of his present letter is to communicate other sort of apparitions than the ghost of barnstable he had gone to glastonbury to pick up a few berries from the holy thorn which flowered every christmas day footnote two o five thousands flocked to see this miracle in the middle ages and their presence brought great wealth to the abbey it was believed to have grown miraculously from the staff used by st joseph it appears to have been brought from palestine and merely to have flowered in accordance with its natural season though differing with ours End of footnote. the original thorn had been cut down by a military saint in the civil wars but the trade of the place was not damaged for they had contrived not to have a single holy thorn but several by grafting and inoculation footnote 206 taylor 
the water poet in his wonders of the west sixteen forty nine says that a slip was preserved by a vintner dwelling at glastonbury when the soldiers cut down the tree that he set it in his garden and he with others did tell me that the same doth likewise bloom on the twenty-fifth day of december yearly End of footnote. he promised to send these berries but requests aubrey to inform that person of quality who had rather have a bush that it was impossible to get one for him i am told he adds that there is a person about glastonbury who hath a nursery of them which he sells for a crown apiece but they are supposed not to be of the right kind the main object of this letter is the writer's suspicion of gold in this country for which he offers three reasons tacitus says there was gold in england and that agrippa came to a spot where he had a prospect of ireland from which place he writes secondly that an honest man had in this spot found stones from which he had extracted good gold and that he himself had seen in the broken stones a clear appearance of gold and thirdly there is a story which goes by tradition in that part of the country that in the hill alluded to there was a door into a hole that when any wanted money they used to go and knock there that a woman used to appear and give to such as came footnote two o seven many of these tales of treasures in hills are now reduced to the simple facts of discoveries being made of coins and personal ornaments in tumuli of roman and saxon settlers in england in the british museum is a gold breastplate found in a grave at mould in flintshire the grave hills of bohemia have furnished the museum at vienna with a large number of gold objects of great size and value in russia the dead have been found placed between large plates of pure gold in the centre of such tumuli and in ireland very large and valuable gold personal ornaments have been frequently found in grave hills End of footnote. at a time when by greediness or otherwise gave her offence she flung to the door and delivered this old saying still remembered in the country when all the daws be gone and dead then hill shall shine gold red my fancy is that this relates to an ancient family of this name of which there is now but one man left and he not likely to have any issue these are his three reasons and some minds have perhaps been opened with no better ones but let us not imagine that this great naturalist was credulous for he tells aubrey that he thought it was but a monkish tale forged in the abbey so famous in former time but as i have learned not to despise our forefathers i question whether this may not refer to some rich mine in the hill formerly in use but now lost i shall shortly request you to discourse with my lord about it to have advice and see in the meantime it will be best to keep all private for his majesty's service his lordship's and perhaps some private person's benefit but he has also positive evidence a mason not long ago coming to the renter of the abbey for a freestone and sawing it out came diverse pieces of gold of three pounds ten value apiece of ancient coins the stone belonged to some chimney work the gold was hidden in it perhaps when the dissolution was near this last incident of finding coins in a chimney piece which he had accounted for very rationally serves only to confirm his dream that they were coined out of the gold of the mine in the hill and he becomes more urgent for a private search into these mines which i have i think a way to in the postscript he adds an account of a well which by washing wrought a cure on a person deep in the king's evil i hope you don't forget your promise to communicate whatever thing you have relating to your idea this promised idea of aubrey may be found in his m s s under the title of the idea of universal education however whimsical one would like to see it 
aubrey's life might furnish a volume of these philosophical dreams he was a person who from his incessant bustle and insatiable curiosity was called the carrier of conceptions of the royal society many pleasant nights were privately enjoyed by aubrey and his correspondent about the mine in the hill ashmole's manuscripts at oxford contain a collection of many secrets of the rostocretians one of the completest inventions is a recipe how to walk invisible such were the fancies which rocked the children of science in their cradles and so feeble were the steps of our curious infancy but i start in my dreams dreading the reader may also have fallen asleep measure is most excellent says one of the oracles to which also we being in like manner persuaded o oh, most friendly and pious asclepiades here finish the dreams at the dawn of philosophy end of section thirty five Section thirty six of Curiosities of Literature, Volume three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. On Puck the Commentator. Literary forgeries recently have been frequently indulged in, and it is urged that they are of an innocent nature but impostures more easily practised than detected leave their mischief behind to take effect at a distant period and here we have a footnote a remarkable instance is afforded in the present work see the notes of the article in newspapers in volume one detailing one which has spread falsity to an enormous extent throughout our general literature and we go on we have ourselves witnessed versions of Spanish and Portuguese poets, which are passed on their unsuspicious readers without difficulty, but in which no parts of the pretended originals can be traced, and to the present hour, whatever antiquaries may affirm, the poems of Chatterton and Assyan are veiled in mystery. And here we have two more footnotes. The first, the pretended antique manuscripts preserved among the Chatterton papers in the British Museum, as well as the facsimile of the Yellow Roll, published in the Cambridge edition of Chatterton's works, are, however, so totally unlike the writing of the era to which they purport to belong, that no doubt need be entertained as to their falsity. And the second. They are, however, so far determined by the fragments of Gaelic originals, since published by Scottish antiquaries, that the amplifications of Macpherson can be detected. And we go on. If we possessed the secret history of the literary life of George Stevens, it would display an unparalleled series of arch deception and malicious ingenuity. He has been happily characterised by Gifford as the puck of commentators. Stevens is a creature so spotted over with literary forgeries and adulterations that any remarkable one around the time he flourished may be attributed to him. There were the habits of a depraved mind, and there was a darkness in his character many shades deeper than belonged to Puck. Even in the playfulness of his invention there was usually a turn of personal malignity, and the real object was not so much to raise a laugh as to grin horribly a ghastly smile on the individual. It is more than rumoured that he carried his ingenious malignity into the privacies of domestic life, and it is to be regretted that Mr. Nichols, who might have furnished much secret history of this extraordinary literary forger, has from delicacy mutilated his collective vigour. George Stevens usually commenced his operations by opening some pretended discovery in the evening papers, which were then of a more literary cast than they are at present. The St. James's Chronicle, the General Evening Post, or the Whitehall, were they not dead in body and in spirit, would now bear witness to his successful efforts. The late Mr. Boswell told me that Stevens frequently wrote notes on Shakespeare purposely to mislead or entrap Malone, and obtained for himself an easy triumph in the next edition. Stevens loved to assist the credulous in getting up for them some strange new thing, dancing them about with a will-o'-the-wisp, now alarming them by a shriek of laughter, and now like a grinning pig-wigging, sinking them chin-deep into a quagmire. Once he presented them with a fictitious portrait of Shakespeare, and when the Brotherhood were sufficiently divided in their opinions, he pounced upon them with a demonstration that every portrait of Shakespeare partook of the same doubtful authority. Stevens usually assumed a nom de guerre of Collins, a pseudo-commentator, and sometimes of Amner, who was discovered to be an obscure Puritanic minister who never read text or notes of a playwright, whenever he explored into a thousand notable secrets with which he has polluted the pages of Shakespeare. 
The marvellous narrative of the Upas tree of Java, which Darwin adopted in his plan of enlisting imagination under the banner of science, appears to have been another forgery which amused our puck. It was first given in the London magazine as an extract from a Dutch traveller, but the extract was never discovered in the original author, and the effluvia of this noxious tree, which through a district of twelve or fourteen miles had killed all vegetation, and had spread the skeletons of men and animals, affording a scene of melancholy beyond what poets have described or painted delineated, is perfectly chimerical. A splendid flim-flam. When Dr. Birkenhout was busied in writing, without much knowledge or skill, a history of our English authors, Stevens allowed the good man to insert a choice letter by George Peel, giving an account of a merry meeting at the Globe, wherein Shakespeare said Ben Jonson and Nedaline are admirably made to perform their respective parts. As the nature of the biographical literary required authorities, Stevens ingeniously added, whence I copied this letter I do not recollect. However, we well know it came from the theatrical mirror, where he had first deposited the precious original, to which he had unguardedly ventured to affix the date of 1600. Unluckily, Peel was discovered to have died two years before he wrote his own letter. The date is adroitly dropped in Birkenhout. Stevens did not wish to refer to his original, which I have often seen quoted as authority. One of these numerous forgeries of our puck appears in an article in Isaac Reed's catalogue, article 8708. The Book of Soldan, containing strange matters touching his life and death, and the ways of his course, in two parts, with this marginal note by Reed. The foregoing was written by George Stevens, from whom I received it. It was composed merely to impose on a literary friend, and had its effect. For he was so far deceived as to its authenticity, that he gave implicit credit to it, and put down the person's name in whose possession the original books were supposed to be. One of the sort of inventions which I attribute to Stevens has been got up with a deal of romantic effect to embellish the poetical life of Milton, and unquestionably must have sadly perplexed his last matter-of-fact editor, who is not a man to comprehend a flim-flam, for he has sanctioned the whole fiction by preserving it in his biographical narrative. The first impulse of Milton to travel in Italy is ascribed to the circumstance of his having been found asleep at the foot of a tree in the vicinity of Cambridge, when two foreign ladies, attracted by the loveliness of the youthful poet, alighted from their carriage and having admired him for some time as they imagined unperceived, the youngest, who was very beautiful, drew a pencil from her pocket and having written some lines, put the paper with a trembling hand into his own. But it seems, for something was to account for how the youth could have been aware of these minute particulars unless he had been dreaming them, that the ladies had been observed at a distance by some friends of Milton, and they explained to him the whole silent adventure. Milton, on opening the paper, read four verses from Guarini, addressed to those human stars, his own eyes. On this romantic adventure, Milton set off for Italy, to discover the fair incognita to which undiscovered lady, we are told, we stand indebted for the most impassioned touches in the paradise lost. We know how Milton passed his time in Italy, with Dati and Gardi and Frescobaldi and other literary friends amidst its academies, and often busied in book collecting. Had Milton's tour in Italy been an adventure of knight errantry to discover a lady whom he had never seen, at least he had not the merit of going out of the direct road to Florence and Rome, nor of having once alluded to this Don de Sanspensis in his letters or inquiries among his friends, who would have thought themselves fortunate to have introduced so poetical an adventure in the numerous canzoni they showered on our youthful poet. This historiette, scarcely fitted for a novel, first appeared where generally Stephen's literary amusements were carried on. The General Evening Post, or the St. James's Chronicle. And Mr. Todd, in the improved edition of Milton's life, obtained this spurious original, where the reader may find it. But the more curious part of the story remains to be told. Mr. Todd proceeds. The proceedingly highly coloured relation, however, is not singular. My friend Mr. Walker points out to me a counterpart in the extract from the preface to Poissy de Marguerite Eleanor Clotilde depuis Madame de Seville, poet François de Quinze siècle, Paris, 1803. And true enough, we find among the family traditions of the same Clotilde that Justine de Lévy, great-grandmother of this unknown poetess of the 15th century, walking in a forest, witnessed the same beautiful spectacle which the Italian unknown had at Cambridge. Never was such an impression to be effaced, and she could not avoid leaving her tablets by the side of the beautiful sleeper, declaring her passion in her tablets by four Italian verses. The very number our Milton had meted out to him. Oh, these four verses, they are as fatal in their number as the date of Peel's letter proved to George Stevens. Something still escapes in the most ingenious fabrication which serves to decompose the materials. 
It is well that our voracious historian dropped all mention of Guarini, else that would have given that coup de grâce a fatal anachronism. However, his invention supplied him with more originality than the adoption of this story and the four verses would lead us to infer. He tells us how Petrarch was jealous of the genius of his Clotilde's grandmother, and has even pointed out a sonnet which, among the traditions of the family, was addressed to her. He narrates that the gentleman, when he fairly awoke and had read the four verses, set off for Italy, which he ran over until he found Justine, and Justine found him, at a tournament at Medina. This parallel adventure disconcerted our two grave English critics. They find a tale which they wisely judge improbable, and because they discover the tale copied, they conclude that it is not singular. This knot of perplexity is, however, easily cut through if we substitute, which we are fully justified in, for poet de quinze siècles de dix-neuf siècles. The Poissies of Clotilde are as genuine a fabrication as Chatterton's, subject to the same objections, having many ideas and expressions which were unknown in the language at the time they are pretended to have been composed, and exhibiting many imitations of Voltaire and other poets. The present story of the four Italian verses in The Beautiful Sleeper would be quite sufficient evidence of the authenticity of the family traditions of Clotilde depuis Madame de Seville, and also of Monsieur de Seville himself, a pretended editor who is said to have found by mere accident the precious manuscript. And while he was copying from the press in 1793, these pretty poems, for such they are, of his grand tante, were shot in the reign of terror, and so completely expired that no one could ever trace his existence. The real editor, who we must presume to be the poet, published them in 1803. Such, then, is the history of a literary forgery. A puck composes a short romantic adventure, which is quietly thrown out to the world in a newspaper or a magazine. Some collector, such as the late Mr. Bindley, who procured for Mr. Todd his original, as idle at least as he is curious, houses the forlorn fiction, and it enters into literary history. A French Chatterton picks up the obscure tale, and behold, astonishes the literary inquirers of the very country hence the imposture sprung. But the four Italian verses in The Sleeping Youth, oh, Monsieur Vanderberg, for that gentleman is the ostensible editor of Clotilde's Poissies of the 15th century. Some ingenious persons are unlucky in this world. Perhaps one day we may yet discover that this romantic adventure of Milton and Justine de Lévy is not so original as it seems. It may lie hid in the Austria of Durf, or some of the long romances of the Scuderies, whence the English and the French Chattertons may have drawn it. To such literary inventions we say with Swift, Such are your tricks, that since you hatch, pray your own chicks. Will it be credited that for the enjoyment of a temporary piece of malice, Stevens would even risk his own reputation as a poetical critic? Yet this he ventured by throwing out of his edition the poems of Shakespeare with a remarkable hypercriticism that the strongest act of Parliament that could be framed would fail to compel readers into their service. Not only he denounced the sonnets of Shakespeare, but the sonnet itself with an absurd question. What has truth or nature to do with sonnets? The secret history of this unwarrantable mutilation of a great author by his editor was, as I was informed by the late Mr. Boswell, merely done to spite his rival commentator Malone who had taken extraordinary pains in their elucidation. Stevens himself had formally reprinted them, but when Malone from these sonnets claimed for himself one ivy leaf of a commentator's pride, behold, Stevens in a rage would annihilate even Shakespeare himself, that he might gain a triumph over Malone. In the same spirit, but with more caustic pleasantry, he opened a controversy with Malone respecting Shakespeare's wife. It seems that the poet had forgotten to mention his wife in his copious will, and his recollection of Mrs. Shakespeare seems to mark the slightness of his regard, for he only introduced by an interlineation a legacy to her out of his second best bed with the furniture, and nothing more. Malone naturally inferred that the poet had forgot her, and so recollected her as more strongly to mark how little he esteemed her. He had already, as is vulgarly expressed, cut her off not indeed with a shilling, but with an old bed. And here we have a footnote. Mr. Charles Knight, in his edition of Shakespeare, first clearly pointed out the true nature of the bequest. The great poet's estates, with the exception of the copyhold tenement expressly mentioned in his will, were freehold. His wife was entitled to dower, or a life interest of one-third of the proceeds arising from the lands or tenements the property of Shakespeare, and which were of considerable value. She was thus amply provided for by the clear and undeniable operation of the law of England. Mr. Halliwell has further proved that such bequests were the constant modes of showing regard to such relatives as were well provided for by the usual legal course of events, and he adds, 
So far from this bequest being one of slight importance and exhibiting small esteem, it was the usual mode of expressing a mark of great affection. Let me go on. All this seems judicious, till Stevens asserts the conjugal affection of the bard tells us that the poet, having, when in health, provided for her by settlement, or knowing that her father had already done so, circumstances entirely conjectural, he bequeathed to her at his death not merely an old piece of furniture, but perhaps, as a mark of peculiar tenderness, the very bed that on his bridal night received him to the arms of Belvedere. Stephen's severity of satire marked the deep malevolence of his heart, and Murphy has strongly portrayed him in his address to the malevoly. Such another puck was Horace Walpole. The King of Prussia's letter to Rousseau, and the memorial, pretended to have been signed by noblemen and gentlemen, were fabrications, as he confesses, only to make mischief. It well became him, whose happier invention, the castle of Otranto, was brought forward in the guise of forgery, so unfeelingly to have reprobated the innocent inventions of a Chatterton. We have Pucks busied among our contemporaries. Whoever shall discover their history will find it copious, though intricate. The malignity at least will exceed tenfold the merriment. End of section 36